Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are in the world and thanks so much for joining me for another art tutorial. In today's tutorial, I'm gonna be taking you through my entire process for this pen and watercolor wash crow. I'm gonna be taking you through my three main phases that I usually go through. So I'm getting started with sharing how I create my preliminary pencil sketch freehand in a way that I am utilizing my drawing space effectively and also I'm arriving at a sketch that shows relatively believable proportions based on what I am seeing in a reference photo. Phase two is going to be adding in my ink work. So developing my line work with my pen and also um, utilizing different types of mark making and alternative shading techniques before I move on to adding in my color. And finally, phase three is going to be doing the washes with watercolor. And for this one, I kept my number of colors limited. I'm only going to be using three different colors and I'm gonna be explaining all about the watercolor painting techniques that I like using with this kind of piece. Now, when it comes to creating a pen and watercolor wash piece, I think it's very important that we create a sense of balance between the two mediums. When I'm gonna be using just pen and ink for a piece, then most likely than not, I would push forward a little bit more in terms of my mark making and my alternative shading. But when I'm gonna be bringing in watercolor, I don't want to overly describe with my line work or my ink work. And the same thing goes when I am creating a piece that is just watercolor. In those cases, I am more likely to describe more values, describe more textures with just watercolor. But when I already have some pen and ink work laid down for me, I don't want to overly describe with watercolor. It's all about creating a sense of balance with the two mediums that you're gonna be using and making sure that you don't overly describe with either of them when you're gonna be combining them so that at the end, you don't end up with something that looks very overworked or very overly described or even maybe flat. I'm gonna make sure to leave timestamps to the different phases of this tutorial down below in the text section of this post in case you're primarily interested in learning how to draw birds with graphite or you're interested in learning how to use pen and ink or expanding your knowledge of alternative shading or mark making techniques or if you're interested in improving your watercolor painting. Lots of tips and all of these things are gonna be provided throughout the video. I'm also going to be leaving links to past videos in which I delve in depth into each of these. So if you're interested in developing your freehand sketching skills or your pen and ink skills or your watercolor painting skills independently, then make sure to check out those resources that I'll leave for you down below. So you can skip or jump between these phases as you see fit, depending on your own personal current goals. You could decide to even leave this piece as a pen and ink piece, or you could push through the entire process alongside with me. It's totally up to you. All right, so here is the awesome reference photo that I'm gonna be using for today's pen and watercolor wash piece. I found it over at pexels.com, which is a great free art reference photo site and it was taken by photographer Jack Bulmer. After having downloaded it, I opened it up in Photoshop, I modified the cropping, and I made the colors brighter. I upped the contrast because the colors were a little bit too dark, and then once I was happy with how my reference photo allowed me to see different values throughout the bird and everything, then I got started. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started with our freehand preliminary pencil sketch. So if you've checked out any of my past drawing tutorials in which I'm drawing with pencil, then you probably already know that I like using an HB drawing pencil and I like making sure that I am drawing lightly so that I don't scratch or damage my watercolor paper and also so that I can erase mistakes and refine my sketch along the way. And also because later on, I wanna be able to completely erase out all of my pencil work after I'm done with my pen and ink sketching process. Now in other drawing tutorials, I've also shared about my envelope method that I always get started with, doesn't matter what it is that I am drawing. And in the past, I've shared videos in which you can see me use this method for getting started with a still life arrangement sketch 
and also for a sketch in which I'm drawing a pair of boots. Essentially, what I am visualizing here as I am laying down these straighter um, lines that lead to blockier uh, shapes is I am visualizing the bird that I am seeing in my reference photo as being wrapped with wrapping paper, as being covered with an envelope. So I am just visualizing its general overall silhouette, the major angles created throughout, and that is what I am trying to replicate to the best of my abilities. And you can see me continue to erase and refine along the way as I continue comparing my sketch to my reference photo. By the way, I always make sure to use a soft graphite eraser on my watercolor paper so that I don't damage it because erasers can also damage your watercolor paper. So make sure that you're using a soft one. But I continue acknowledging everything as a whole and continue to compare my sketch to my reference photo, noticing if I have to modify angles, if I have to make something larger or smaller or move a line a little bit more to the left or to the right. Um, as you continue working on your freehand sketching, your observational skills, your visual measuring skills, they improve and your errors in proportion um, and shape and angles and all of that, they get smaller and smaller. The more lines, the more elements you start adding into your drawings, the more points of comparison you start to have, and the more easily you're able to see little mistakes that you need to correct so that the proportions are more similar to what you're seeing in your reference photo or whatever it is that you have in front of you in real life that you're drawing from direct observation. But you can see me right here how I'm starting to move on to uh, drawing smaller parts of this bird once that largest uh, body overall shape has been created um, effectively or as best as I could. I then start separating out that larger shape into smaller shapes and move on like that from largest and more general towards smaller elements. Something that you have to always have in mind when it comes to recreating proportions effectively for whatever it is that you're trying to draw is that getting proportions right is all about getting the relationships between the different parts making up the whole as close as possible to what it is that you're seeing in the photo. It's all about those relationships between the parts making up the whole. It's not just about one thing, it's about how everything fits together and relates to each other in terms of size, location, etc. So what this takes is really continuing to compare on and on and on lengths, widths, locations, angles created between all of these different parts, right? It's about getting those relationships right. It's about coming back to see the whole. It's not just about one single thing or one single part of the subject. Along the way, ask yourself questions such as, how many times would this head shape fit into the entire body shape of the bird? Or how long is the tail in comparison with the entire body of the bird? Or where is the end tip of this wing compared to the end tip of the tail? How long are these legs compared to the height of the bird's body? How close is the eye to the beak? Um, and where exactly is this element within this larger shape? Is it closer to the right edge, to the left edge, to the top edge, to the bottom edge? Divide separate sections into halves, into thirds, into fourths, and continue comparing things on and on and on. So I've added in the little legs, I've added in the beak and the eye, and right here, I am doing something that I often do when I am sketching specifically birds, which is I kind of notice the different types of feathers that are happening in that reference photo for this particular bird. Um, birds have different types of feathers throughout their bodies, right? And almost always, at least for when you're seeing a bird at a profile view like this, um, and you're able to see their wings, you're kind of able to tell the different feathers that are happening throughout the wing. 
And so what I did initially was I divided the larger wing kind of shape into smaller sections for the different types of feathers that I was able to perceive um, in a rough way. And then once I divided that entire wing into separate shapes, I then started filling in each one of those shapes with the specific feather shape going on in that larger shape. So I hope that that makes sense. Again, making my way from general towards specifics. Making my way from general towards specifics is very helpful for me, mainly because of two different reasons. Number one, it helps me arrive at better overall proportions. And number two, it really helps me utilize my drawing space more effectively because by working on the whole first, the entire subject as a whole and laying down that general blocky shape in the size and location that I want it to be, I am ensuring that my final result is gonna be exactly where I want it to be within my drawing area and exactly the size that I want it to be within my drawing area. Because when I was getting started in my drawing journey, I was working from left to right or top to bottom or whatever the case may be from one side to the other, right? And I wasn't seeing the, the subject as a whole. And what I always found is that my drawing almost always ended up being way closer to the right edge of my page or to the left edge of my page, or my drawing ended up being way too small or way too large to the point that it ended up not even fitting on my paper, etc. And so by placing that envelope first exactly in the size and location that you want it, there's more of a chance that you're gonna arrive at better results when it comes to utilization of your drawing space. One final thing that I don't wanna to forget to mention is, in this case, I am sketching right on my watercolor sheet because I have drawn birds, uh, I wouldn't say too much, but I've drawn birds before. And their overall um, uh, complexity is not too challenging for me at this point. But if I were drawing something that I would consider to be challenging or maybe requires knowledge of very specific proportions that I haven't practiced too much, uh, maybe like a face or a human figure or maybe an animal that I haven't drawn before or whatever the case may be, I would definitely have drawn it separately in a sketchbook or another drawing page and then I would have transferred it onto my watercolor paper using tracing paper which for me it's my transferring method of choice and this is so that I can protect my watercolor paper and make sure that I arrive at a preliminary outline sketch that is relatively clean and solid so that it can be a nice foundation for everything else that is gonna be coming up. This is the base foundation for everything else. And if your preliminary sketch is not effective, if you don't spend enough time on it with those proportions and everything like that, or even if you arrive at a messy, uh, dirty look, then that can definitely affect your overall results. So take your time and do whatever it is that you have to do in your particular case, depending on how challenging you find the subject on hand, so that your outcome is of a higher quality. All right, okay, so I am all done with this preliminary pencil sketch and the very last thing that I'm gonna be doing here is I'm gonna be using my kneaded eraser to gently do some tapping all over to lighten that sketch even more and get rid of any unnecessary graphite that might be floating around that may dirty up my piece later on or may uh, create some smudging with my hand and things like that. And with this, I'm all done with this graphite sketch. It's now time to move on to the pen and ink process. I'm gonna be using one of my pigment liners from Stadler in 0.3 tip size. When you're gonna be combining any sort of ink tool or ink with watercolor, it's absolutely essential that you take your time to find a ink pen or ink that is permanent, that is waterproof, that is smudge proof, 
and that is not going to be affected by the application of watercolor paint that is going to come later. This said, there are artists that do their watercoloring first and then do their ink work or do it in the way that I'm going to be sharing with you today, which is what I usually do in which you do the pen and ink work first or your ink work first and then you do the watercoloring. There is no better or worse way to go about it. Both can lead to great looking results, but it is very important that you pick the tools that are gonna help you with your own creative process and way of doing things so that you don't run into unnecessary accidents or surprises along the way that can ruin your entire piece or be very frustrating. And also so that your piece can last a long time after you're done. It's also super, super important to remain patient. So whether you're doing your ink work first or your watercolor painting first, you need to allow that to dry completely before moving on to the next phase of the process. All right, so what I like to get started with almost always is tracing over the outer edges of my subject or my subjects, if there are many subjects in the piece. However, I am making sure not to approach these edges as a outline around my object or my subject. I wanna make sure that I stay away from the look of thick outlines with one consistent weight all throughout. As you can see, I am tackling these edges as separate lines and I am even starting to bring in a, a bit of a feathery edge. Uh, to start describing that, uh, that feather texture, basically. It's very important that if we're going for mid to higher levels of realism in our drawings or paintings, that we stay away from the look of outlines because in realism, there are no outlines. And what I mean with outlines is think of coloring book pages. Think of how coloring book pages have a consistent line weight of almost always they are black outlines all throughout the different elements and sections of that coloring book page, whatever the image is in that coloring book page. That's really what I am trying to stay away from because those thick outlines are going to lead to flatness. And this is something that I've constantly talked about in other pen and ink videos is you want to have line weight variation in mind when you're going for mid to higher levels of realism or simply drawings or sketches that are more dynamic looking, that are more flowy, have more depth to them and are more interesting to look at. So in other words, you want to make sure that the lines and the marks that you create have a line weight variation to them. There is a variety in terms of their thickness and how dark they are. Sometimes you want your lines or your marks or sections of those lines and marks to be thinner and lighter. And other times you want those lines and marks or sections of those lines and marks to be thicker and darker. Generally speaking, I would much rather have slight wobbles in my lines and marks and have them be imperfect, but flowy and have a line weight variation to them than to have lines that are super, super precise and perfect, but look very stiff and very heavy because they're one consistent line weight all throughout and have a very heavy outlining look to them. And as I was explaining in a past pen and ink video, there are four things that you can really start using and shifting and changing mindfully that will help you start developing that line weight variation. Number one, there is the pen tip size in and of itself, because obviously the thinner or the smaller the pen tip size, the lighter, uh, the thinner that line will be versus a pen tip size that is thicker, but there's also the speed at which you move your arm. If you hesitate, if you're moving your arm very slowly, that is likely going to lead to a heavier, uh, stiffer look to that line. Not only this, but the slower you go and the more you hesitate, the more of a chance there is that you're gonna create stop and start marks throughout your lines and marks. 
There is also the angle at which you're using your pen, because if you're using your pen in a more perpendicular way to your paper, then the ink is going to flow down that nib due to gravity a lot more heavily versus when you're using your pen at, let's say, a 45 degree angle, 30 degree angle from your paper, then that ink is not going to fall from your nib as quickly, leading to a thinner, lighter line. And finally, the fourth thing that can really have an impact on your line weight variation is the pressure that you're exerting on your pen. Because if you're exerting more pressure on your pen, there's gonna be more ink coming down, flowing down that tip, versus when you don't exert very much pressure on your pen at all, the lighter and even maybe more broken those lines will be. And of course, the texture of your paper also has a huge impact on how broken your lines are. Some artists like using heavier textured paper and they embrace those broken lines that can happen while others enjoy working on smoother paper because those lines are likely to be more uh, smoothly laid down. You can really start experimenting with these four things to create line weight variation throughout your sketches. And later on, you can start actually planning for specific weights of different lines and marks throughout your piece. Something that's super important to know about when you're getting started with pen and ink and really any type of drawing in general or line work in general is that the thicker, darker lines will pop out more to the viewer than the lines that are thinner and lighter. And you can really play with that in order to create a lot of depth in your piece and bring out the sections of your, um, of your subject, maybe even the focal points out to the viewer more than the sections that are secondary or tertiary in importance. Or if you're drawing something like a scene or a still life arrangement, you might want to use a heavier line weight in elements that are closer to the viewer versus the elements that are farther away. You can use thinner, lighter lines to really make the elements that are closer to the viewer appear like they are closer to them and the other elements look like they are farther away. All right, so at this point in my inking process, I am adding more extra little feathers here and there. I'm really trying not to go overboard with my description of these feathers because of what I mentioned in the beginning of this video. I wanna make sure to not overly describe with either my ink or my watercolor so that I can create a nice balance between my use of these two mediums. But essentially, number one, I went over my edges of the largest shapes. Number two, I went over the edges of my smaller shapes. And when I went over these edges, tracing over my pencil work, I really approached that in sections and I even started incorporating those flicking motions, paying attention to the direction of the feather growth and the length of the feathers in specific sections here and there to start describing a bit of that feather texture throughout the bird. And then once I was done with that, I started adding in extra little feathers here and there, especially throughout the head. And I'd love for you to notice how I kept things very irregular and even added more imperfection throughout the edges of both the larger shapes as well as the smaller shapes. I made them broken and in the tip end of many of these feathers, I created irregular broken edges to also start describing the unevenness in the edges of those feathers instead of creating a perfect smooth curve that might look a little bit too cartoony. I also made sure to add in more of those feathers that are kind of going outwards in, in that beak. That is a very uh, important characteristic in crows and I wanted to make sure to add a good amount of feathers there. And after having done all of that, I am finally adding in some hatching. So hatching is an alternative shading technique just like cross hatching and scribbling and stippling and contour lines and cross contour lines. I explain all about these alternative shading techniques in a past tutorial that I shared on pen and ink shading. 
I highly recommend checking it out because I go much more into depth and explain how to use all of these different alternative shading techniques and provide a very useful exercise that beginners looking to improve their pen and ink shading can work on. But essentially, I am adding hatching in sections that I perceive to be very dark values in that reference photo. All hatching is, is straight parallel lines. And it's important to keep a consistency within those lines in terms of the distance between them and also that the angle that you're laying down that specific group of lines in is consistent throughout that area. The more distanced apart your lines are and the more of that whiteness of the paper you leave uncovered, the lighter the value. And the closer your lines are, the more paper you cover up, so thus you create a darker value. Adding some hatching in between some feathers where I perceive some of that overlapping of the feathers creating a bit of a cast shadow or darker value on the feather underneath in that photo. Right around here, I'm gonna start adding some little marks to help me describe the texture in the little feet and also in the little branch. I'm gonna create a bit of a wood texture. I am really almost done with my pen and ink process here and I'm constantly taking breaks and coming back to see the full picture so that I can make sure that I'm not going overboard with the amount of description that I am doing with my pen and ink. And hopefully you can see how I've kept things moving, I've kept jumping from section to section, and I'm keeping everything relatively loose and adding in a lot of irregularity all throughout. In just a second, you're gonna see me darken the pupil of the bird's eyeball right here, and this I'm gonna do with my pen because I have a little bit more control in this teeny tiny but very important section of the eye. Eyes are a super, super important part of any kind of animal or uh, human portrait or piece. So I finished up with my pen and ink process. I allowed everything to dry for around half an hour. The ink offered in these Stadler pens dries pretty fast, but I wanted to make sure that nothing would smudge. And once everything was completely dry, I took my soft eraser and I erased out all of my pencil work that was still visible underneath that ink. And with that, we're ready to get started with the final part of this process, which is going to be the watercolor washes. So I am going to be using only three different colors for my watercolor washes. And these colors are Azure, Indigo, and Burnt Sienna. These are all colors from my St. Petersburg White Knights full pen paint set and you by no means have to use the exact same colors that I'm going to be using. I'd recommend using what you have available that is most similar to the colors that I'm going to be swatching out for you right here on my scrap piece of watercolor paper. So what I am doing right here is I am preparing five different little puddles of color in different wells on my color mixing palette using these three colors. The ones at the top are just burnt sienna at the top right with a little bit of water in it. On the left of that, I have indigo with a little bit of water in it. Underneath those two, in that largest well of my color mixing palette, I have a mixture of the two. So that dark gray color is a mix of indigo plus burnt sienna. And when you're creating your gray color mixture, make sure that you arrive at something that looks like a gray because if you have more burnt sienna in your color mixture than your whatever dark blue it is that you choose, it's gonna look like a dark brown. And if you have more blue than brown in your color mixture, it's gonna look like a dark blue. And you kind of need a 50-50 amount of each for it to look like a dark gray. Once you're done with that dark gray, you're gonna need a brighter blue, and this is a color that we're gonna be using to paint in a little bit of a background. We're gonna be painting in a bit of a sky color in a vignette style, and you want a brighter blue for that. And for this, I chose my Azure, which is way brighter than the Indigo, which I'm gonna be using primarily inside of the bird. And the dark brown that you see right beside it is also a mixture of burnt sienna plus indigo. But in that mixture, I have way more of the burnt sienna in it than of the indigo. So that looks like a dark brown. 
Make sure you create nice juicy color mixtures on your color mixing palette of all of these colors. You want a good amount of pigmentation in them, but also some water in them. This is by no means all of the paint that I'm gonna be using throughout this painting process. I'm gonna be making more of different colors as needed um, as they run out and also adding in maybe more water into my color mixtures or adding in more of one color or another color as needed. All right, so once my color mixtures were ready, I changed my water because it was pretty murky and I'm gonna be doing some pre-wetting to get started. So with my container of fresh, clean water, what I am doing here is I am using my size six mop brush to do pre-wetting all throughout the bird's body. I'm not doing any pre-wetting in the little legs and feet, but I am pre-wetting the beak. I am avoiding the eye, and I'm also leaving a sliver of paper all throughout the top of the beak, the top of the head, and all down the top edge of the bird's body with no water in them. I'm not pre-wetting those sections because I am planning those sections to be a bit of a highlight. And when we're painting with watercolor, it's all about planning for sections of highlights and keeping them protected throughout the painting process so that we don't cover them up with paint or have paint expanded to those areas. When we're painting with watercolor, we create highlights by keeping the whiteness of the paper shining through unpainted in those sections. The white of the paper stands in place for our highlights. And so because I want to make sure that those sections of paper are left unpainted and I don't want any paint to expand into those areas, I leave those sections of highlights dry with no water in them. If I feel my larger mop brush is a little bit too big to do careful pre-wetting in some smaller sections, I do switch on over to my size six round brush and do my pre-wetting with the smaller brush. Take time when you're doing your pre-wetting and make sure that you arrive at a nice even sheen all throughout this area. You should be able to allow that water to settle on your paper for at least 10 to 15 seconds without any sections starting to dry on you. And if any sections do start to dry way too fast, it probably means you haven't pre-wetted enough. Make sure that you're bringing out just a little bit of water at a time from that container onto your paper and make sure that you don't have any puddles anywhere before starting to drop in your color. And if you do have excess water anywhere in this area, just remove all of the water from your paintbrush bristles, dab your tips of your bristles on your absorbent towel, which you should always have on hand an absorbent towel or kitchen paper towel or something like that when you're painting with watercolor to stay on top of water control. And then you can use the clean and semi-dry bristles of your paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge to get rid of any excess water and puddles. Just smooth those bristles of your paintbrush gently over this section and that should remove the excess water. Doing pre-wetting is super, super helpful when you're gonna be painting larger areas, creating larger washes because by doing your pre-wetting, you're depositing a certain amount of water content on your paper, and that is gonna help that paint dry a lot more slowly, and also you're gonna be able to create nice diffused out effects. That water is going to make it so that you have more working time, because when you start painting on paper that is dry, that paper starts soaking up and absorbing that paint immediately when it's placed on paper. The paper is super thirsty and you're left with sharp defined edges around the shapes that you paint in. And most likely than not, when you're painting those larger washes, which oftentimes come in the beginning of your watercolor painting process, you're not looking for sharp and defined edges because that is going to lead to a texture that you probably don't want in those larger washes of color. So by taking time to do pre-wetting, you are giving yourself more working time. You're gonna be able to spend more time developing those values, developing your colors, moving around your paint and getting rid of little textures that you don't want and so on and so forth before that paint starts to dry on you. All right, so after having done my pre-wetting, I started dropping in my indigo. This is all indigo so far. 
And what I am doing is I am placing a bit of indigo at a time. This is my size six round brush, by the way. And I always start by dropping in my color in darkest value areas that I see in the reference photo. Why? Because this way that color is going to expand out right? Because that paper is wet and there's just going to be a very, very small amount of that color reaching lighter value areas, which is exactly what I want. To make something look like it has volume to it, look like it's a little bit more realistic and 3D, we need to develop a wide range of values. We need highlights, we need a wide range of mid-tones, and we need darkest dark areas. And I've already planned for my highlights, right? I've kept my highlights protected by not having done my pre-wetting. You can see how I have that whiteness of the paper shining through completely along the upper edge all throughout that bird from the beak and a sliver along the top part of its body, right? Those are the brightest highlights. But I also need very, very light areas in which that color is very light and translucent. And then there are the darker values. And these are areas in which I start by placing that color. So I have a greater amount of that pigment in those areas. And then later on, I apply even more pigment or do some overlapping in those darker value sections to darken them even more, to create even more color saturation. So that's basically all I did. I continued applying my indigo a bit at a time always starting by placing the majority of that color in darkest value sections. I allow that paint to expand out to do its own thing. And then once I felt I had placed enough color, I removed all of the color from my paintbrush bristles and I went back in with a clean and only slightly damp paintbrush. And sometimes I moved that color a little bit. I created softer looking gradients into lighter mid-tone areas got rid of little textures that maybe I didn't like so much by very gently and minimally running my paintbrush bristles over that paint and so on and so forth until I arrived at a nice range of values and I continued placing a little bit more of that indigo at a time in sections that I wanted to darken even more to saturate that color even further. It's very important to continue observing that reference photo, notice sections of darkest darks, of um, cast shadows in between overlapping feathers, sections where maybe you are uh, trying to round out that shape of that body a little bit, etc. You can also see how I started placing some of my burnt sienna in some sections. In some cases, I placed it also in darkest value sections to add a little bit of a different color temperature in these areas because burnt sienna is a very warm reddish brown, uh, which can definitely help add interest into this otherwise very dark, cool looking uh, bird. And I also placed a tiny bit of burnt sienna in other little sections here and there just to add a little bit more color in other places. And after that, I started using my gray, my burnt sienna plus indigo color combination, which is a very dark gray. And I only place that color in the very darkest value sections, right at the top of the tail there and in the belly of the bird and a little bit in the neck and under the beak. And throughout this entire process, my paper has still been wet and workable. And it has not arrived at any awkward um, semi-dry state at which I really shouldn't be doing much at all. I've had a lot of working time because I took time to do that pre-wetting. All right, so I finished up with the main body of the bird and now I am working on the little legs and feet. And these I'm gonna be painting on dry paper because these sections are very small and I just want a bit more control. So not only am I working on dry paper, but I'm also switching on over to a smaller round brush. This is a size three that I'm working with. And you can see how even in the little legs and feet, I made sure to leave little edges of highlights that I left just with the whiteness of the paper shining through. And initially I went in with a very translucent version of my indigo. And then I developed some darker values on top of that with my gray. 
in the sections that made sense for me to add a little bit of a darker value in right underneath the major mass of that bird's body. And I dropped in a little bit of burnt sienna as well for a bit of color variation. And from there, I painted in the little tree branch on dry paper once again. And I started with the lighter color that I would be using for this section, which was the burnt sienna. And then while that initial layer of burnt sienna was still wet, I dropped in a little bit of the darker brown that I created by mixing together the indigo plus the burnt sienna. And I mostly added in that darker brown along the top edge of that branch and beneath the bird's feet, where it would make sense for the bird to be creating a bit of a cast shadow on it and also to round out that branch a little bit. I also painted in the colored section of the eye with burnt sienna in a very translucent state. And I dropped in a tiny, tiny bit of gray along a few of the edges of that iris here and there. After finishing up there, it was time to get started with painting in a little bit of blue into the sky background. And as I said before, I'm going to be creating a little bit of a vignette style background, just adding a little bit of a hint of blue to create a little illusion of sky behind this bird. Basically, I want that background shape to be very organic and very irregular. And I want to create a gradient in which that blue turns into the whiteness of the paper as that blue is extending away from the bird and towards the edges of my paper. So what I did was I switched on back to my larger mop brush to do some pre-wetting with clean water, which I would recommend changing your water again to make sure that it's nice and clean before creating your background and make sure that you are pre-wetting a large enough area so that the paint that you drop in has space to expand out. Uh, you definitely want to pre-wet way past that section where you want that gradient to happen because if you just pre-wet a very small shape, it's very likely that when you drop in your paint, that paint is going to expand and cover up that very small shape that you pre-wetted and you're gonna be left with sharp edges because that paint, it's gonna reach all the way to the opposite edge and that's gonna create a sharp edge. So make sure that you pre-wet a good large shape. You can even pre-wet all the way to the edge of your paper if you'd like, depending on the size of the paper that you're working on but make sure that you take your time with your pre-wetting. As you can see, I'm working on a section at a time. And once I've arrived at a nice even sheen all throughout that pre-wetted shape, I drop in my azure, my bright blue. And while that azure is wet still, I drop in my indigo into certain little sections here and there to integrate my subject into my background a little bit. It creates a little bit more of a coherent effect. And I'm doing the exact same thing that I've been doing, dropping in a bit of color at a time. And if I feel I've placed enough color on my paper already, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and go back in with just a tiny bit of water in my paintbrush. You definitely don't want to go in with too much water if there's already water on your paper that's drying because you can create backgrounds accidentally. Uh, and drop in way too much water on paint that is already in the drying process. And that can be an issue. But anyway, once I've placed enough color on my paper, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and I go back in to do gentle moving around. If you have to integrate that indigo into your azure or whatever blues it is that you're using a little bit more, you can do that. But really once that paint has been placed on your paper, you wanna do very minimal moving around. Embrace the effects that happen when you drop that paint into your paper. As I am dropping in my color, I'm making sure to keep everything loose, very irregular. And I keep an eye on my paper when I'm dropping in that color. Whenever I feel I have placed enough color, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and I go back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush to do a little bit of pulling outwards. And that is going to help you create that gradient if the paint and the water are not uh, doing it on their own. All right, moving on to the very final stage of this painting process. And this is going to be to push darkest value areas with a bit of wet on dry. Right here, I am using my dark brown, so my burnt sienna plus indigo color mixture in a pretty translucent state. It's not super saturated or super dry. And I darken certain sections around that iris in the bird's eyeball. 
The bird was completely dry by this point. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be working wet on dry and what I am focusing on is pushing darkest dark areas a little bit more. I am working with my size three round brush and I am going in with the same colors that I was using before for all of these different areas, only I am now applying them on dry paper, which is going to make them look a little bit darker than how they would look if I were dropping them into pre-wetted paper because now that color is not going to expand out. There's no water content on my paper that is gonna get added to the water content in my color mixtures. And you can see what my color mixtures look like on my color mixing palette at this point in the process. There's a very small amount of paint left in those mixing wells. And I'm just dipping my paintbrush in my container of water and reactivating that color that has oftentimes already dried because there is such a small amount of my color mixing palette. And I'm just taking a very, very small amount of that color. So it's still going on pretty translucent, but because I am overlapping more color on top of each other, I am darkening darkest value sections. So I'm constantly looking at that reference photo and noticing sections that I wanna push those values in a little bit more, sections in which I perceive darkest values, sections in between the feathers in which I perceive uh, overlapping and cast shadows, in the upper section of the tail, the upper section of the legs, the underneath section of the beak, and all of those things. You're also going to see me use these different colors, my indigo and my gray, and sometimes even my burnt sienna, in a very translucent state to create a little bit of a definition along some of the edges of some of the feathers in the bird's back. And because I am painting on dry paper, I'm being left with sharp defined edges around these shapes that I am painting in. So whenever I want to soften an edge, and I don't always do this, um, having sharp edges here and there is perfectly fine. I actually like having a combination of soft edges and sharper edges. But whenever I wanna go in and soften an edge, all I have to do is remove the color from my paintbrush bristles, go in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush and run my bristles of my paintbrush over the edge that I wanna soften while that little shape is still wet. I'm really acknowledging all of these darkest value shapes as abstract, irregular shapes, and I am continuing even at this point to stay away from the look of harsh outlines anywhere. Right here, I'm gonna do some teeny tiny flicking motions using those same marks I had created with my pen to enhance the illusion of these smaller feathers in the bird's head. I am making sure to go in with my paint in a very translucent state. Uh, this is very important so that these marks that you create with your paintbrush and your paint are not super stark looking because that can be very, very distracting. I want those to be kind of subtle when they dry. And with this, I am all done. I don't want to overly describe with my watercolor. So I'm gonna leave this piece as is so that it can still look nice and fresh and relatively loose. That's what I want. And we are all done. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, please make sure to check out everything that I'm offering over at my Patreon membership website because for a very small amount a month, you get immediate access to my most exclusive resources in the form of real-time, step-by-step, fully narrated tutorials that I don't share anywhere else. All of the tutorials that I share over on Patreon include my downloadable outline sketch, my high-resolution reference photos, and my supply lists, including the list of specific colors that I use for the piece on hand, Patreon community members also have access to my weekly sketchbook prompts, which are designed to help you stay consistent and making progress as an artist. There's also a library of classes on art fundamentals that now has over 20 classes in it and that gets added to each and every month. Monthly live Q&A sessions with me in which community members get to ask me anything they'd like feedback from me on your work, and much, much more. So go ahead and check it out. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things. So you can pick whichever one you need. I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to that down below in the description box. All right, you guys, that is gonna do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, 
pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.